the true value of a treaty is not in adopting it, it's in implementing it. And I hope that we really remember the spirit of Nairobi and waste no time in getting forward and moving forward on these important tasks. It's time, friends, to act for nature. The Global Plastic Treaty negotiations kicked off in November last year. This is a historic moment for Asia because after decades of plastic waste washing up on their shores and impacting the health of the workers that sorted through these mounds of imported plastic waste, well, finally, maybe there's a way forward. In order to be successful at making true permanent change, though, the treaty negotiations have to include solutions that aren't just about plastic recycling. The three R's, reduce, reuse, and recycle, have been drilled into our heads as a way forward towards a sustainable future. The plastic industry focused heavily on selling us that recycling was the perfect solution to the plastic waste problem. Yet plastic recycling has turned out to be trash, literally. In fact, most of the plastic we've produced so far has ended up in landfills, or worse, in the food that we eat every single day. We need other solutions to the plastic waste crisis. Solutions that involve reduce, reuse, refill, and repair here in Asia. And those types of solutions need to be included in the treaty negotiations. The treaty agreement is not a mechanism to control plastic waste. It's a roadmap for the world to control the life cycle of plastics that have come to dominate our natural environment and impact our health in ways we still don't fully understand. So that's what we're going to talk about in this episode. Luckily, I had the opportunity to speak with two incredibly knowledgeable people about this. Marianne Ledesma, Zero Waste Campaigner with Greenpeace Southeast Asia, based in Manila, who will be attending the INC2 meetings in Paris next week. Greenpeace Southeast Asia is a break free from plastic member organization, and Marianne has a deep knowledge of the plastic crisis here in Asia, as well as how to focus policies so that single use plastic, with all of its health and environmental impacts, can be eliminated from our lives. My other guest is Darina Malana of Envio Indonesia, based in Jakarta. She works with startups in the reuse and refill space in Indonesia. She also has a hands-on view of what types of programs and regulations work in the megacities in Asia so that single-use plastic consumption can be dramatically reduced. To wrap up, we talk about what you listeners can do to support their efforts at the treaty negotiations. I'm Marcy Trent Long. Welcome to our Season 17 Global Plastics Treaty Negotiations. We partnered with Break Free from Plastic, BFFP, to produce this series. Hey, you guys, where are you sitting right now? I actually just moved to an apartment that is above an MRT station because I really love public transport. <laughs> yeah, because it's kind of a new train station, right? It's yeah, kind of a new yeah, train yeah. system. Yeah, and where are you, Marianne? I'm in Quezon City right now in Metro Manila. <laughs> we just moved to our new place. So. Oh, oh, you great. did too, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so nice. Well, you guys are incredible, dedicated people on this whole plastic initiative. So thank you very much. It's not an easy task. And I know you're not moving into mansions because you're working for Greenpeace and you're working for Envio, right? So, so exactly. exactly. It's a dedicated job. Well, why don't we just start with Marianne. In March of last year, 175 countries from the UN member states endorsed a historic resolution at the UN Environment Assembly in Nairobi to end plastic pollution and forge an international legal binding agreement by 2024. The good news, the resolution addresses the full life cycle of plastic, including its production, design, and disposal. So, Marianne, maybe you could give us a 
brief history of kind of how we got to this milestone and what's happened in the last year since the announcement? Well, this treaty has been several years in the making and it really has started years ago when more and more stakeholders were calling on for action on plastic pollution. And then this particular resolution that was passed last year, it all really started with Peru and Rwanda submitting a resolution to act on plastic pollution. And it talked about the whole life cycle of plastics, which is what we want in a global plastics treaty. And this was supported by many other states. And of course, there was a lot of back and forth between all these different UN member states trying to get what they want in this resolution. But what was great was eventually when it did get adopted, it wasn't just limited to marine plastic pollution, but it really included the entire scope of the plastic crisis. And right. when that happened, there were now treaty negotiations that started last year and we're going into the second intergovernmental negotiating committee meeting this month. Right. They're called INC meetings yeah. and there's always a technical term for all yeah. these meetings. So we'll try, we'll try to avoid those, but maybe you could just explain why that life cycle, getting the full life cycle production design and disposal, why that's so important. Well, it's vital because when we talk about the plastic pollution crisis, we should be starting at extraction and production. What's so problematic about plastic as a material is that 99% of it is made of fossil fuels, and this directly contributes to the climate crisis. So if we're just focusing on the end of life of plastic, basically plastic disposal, waste management, then we overlook all of the impacts and harms that are occurring when you're extracting fossil fuels and resources to make these plastics, when you're producing plastics and are contaminating surrounding environments with emissions and toxic contamination. You're also overlooking a lot of risks when it comes to plastic as a material having a lot of toxic chemical additives. So you want the full life cycle of plastics to be addressed because in every stage of that life cycle, there are harms, there are greenhouse gases emissions, health risks involved. So it recognizes the fact that plastic is also a health issue as well as the marine pollution issue. So then, uh, Tarina, there's a significant momentum for zero waste in Indonesia. They're focusing on the zero waste because we really want to focus on reduction and reuse rather than recycling. You're the program lead at Zero Waste Living Lab with mm -hmm. NVO, and you even co-founded your own refill business, which is cool, called QYOS. So how do you think refill and reuse options are going to solve the plastic waste crisis in Asia? And maybe you could answer that by giving us some examples of your startups. We see that it's, it's a crisis already. We're trying to stop the overflowing um, generation of plastic waste by stopping it at its source from the production. And so uh, that is exactly what reuse and refill is doing because it replaces the single use plastic in the products that we use daily with reusable and refillable. So, well, it's not overflowing anymore. Of course, sometimes the debate is that, but, but it needs to be mopped. We need to stop the generation as well, right? So that's why I think why reuse and refill become very crucial and urgent for us to do because we really need to make it happen. And the example of what we do here at NVU in Indonesia as well is that we are tackling plastic waste, which is the food and beverages industry as well as mm -hmm. FMCG. And so one of the mm -hmm. venture that I co-founded Kiosk is focusing on the refill technology, how it is making the machine for refills. And as well as for at NVU, what we're trying to do with both FNB and FMCG industry is that here I actually have a sample. So you guys can look at see. <laughs> I know the listeners can't see it, but yeah, yeah. so you, you fill it's yes. the, the, the vending yeah, machine, it, right? And you just fill it machine. up. Yes, just fill it up. And what we do is trying to tackle both refill and reuse. And so refill is with the venture kiosk, but for reuse, we do have Alner. It's for also FMCG, but the idea is really replacing the sachet or the single use packaging that you use for FMCG products 
it's really easy and maybe this is really common like the milk subscription where if your milk runs out you just put it in front of your house and the employee of the company pick it up again and so that's what we do but we do it also involving the community so in indonesia now Omer is opening up in 200 places for community hub and it's actually most of them are women led so you can just return your packaging in your nearby nearby like a women led community you can just drop the packaging and then buy it again for anything like soap we are now also expanding to rice anything that is in the supermarket we're trying to replace it with the reusable packaging the F&B industry we do have alas which is tackling the online food delivery like oh, now yeah. since covid food, it's it's everywhere though so it's everywhere right yeah. i can imagine and what alas does is that when you subscribe and you have that subscription of packaging and we have now uh, alas is only one year old company but we now all, already open in 20 restaurants and cafes in jakarta that we are partnering with them like if they want to distribute their packaging it could be reusable just like if you finish your food we just text the fleet to pick it up and it's reusable and i think it's been so great for alas that we are the first company that tests out this reusable packaging but the return rate for the food packaging is actually 90% like the customers oh that's are, great right so yeah. yeah i think what i'm trying to say is that actually the people or the community is already very much aware with this problem but the thing is to provide the solution in front of them because it's just now really validated that people actually want to use it so yeah it's that's right enabling access it's enabling access i was just going to follow up with that briefly that um you know and a characteristic of asia right is that there are a lot of apartment buildings so the convenience factor is kind of easy to oh, yeah. address. That's really great because I feel like when ref refill does not work, maybe is when you have to go across town, then you're like, okay, I just used as many carbon emissions getting across town, maybe. So Asia is very well positioned, I think, to do those kinds of ideas. Um, Marianne, we can go back to the treaty and just talk about how you think some of the ideas that Darina is talking about, these great refill, reuse concepts can actually be included in the treaty and, and addressed so they're, they're more encouraged because it, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't just be NGOs that are doing this, right? It should be big business. Yeah, I, you make a very good point that while all of these smaller and medium enterprises are, collectively do make a difference, it's vital that we have the bigger multinational corporations, entire industries change the way they're doing business. And with the plastics treaty, we have that opportunity to address it and institutionalize reuse and refill systems, essentially. Um, leading up to the INC, uh, the UNEP or the UN Environment uh, Program Secretariat released a paper on different options of what we call elements that we can include in the treaty itself. And reuse is mentioned as a possible core obligation for member states so that we can encourage reduction, reuse, and then repair. And this is through redesigning products. So how we would incorporate reuse in a plastic treaty is by having things like targets for reuse and refilling of products and packaging. You could also encourage reuse with plastic reduction targets and repairability targets so that producers are motivated to shift to reuse and refill models. Another possible control measure, that's the term that they use for the treaty, that we could include is regulating reuse and refill with like guidelines, harmonized standards for these systems and also for different kinds of reusable packaging, having reuse requirements for producers so that when they create their products or their packaging, you already have built-in criteria to make them reusable. And all of these different kinds of potential provisions in a treaty will really help different countries also create standards uh, on national levels, also help them make laws for it, and uh, basically translate this global treaty into actual um, like 
interoperable laws at a local level. And I think one thing we do have to watch out for, because in that same paper, they sort of limit reuse to just reusing plastics, which is, uh, as a material, is problematic in itself. So we should, when we discuss reuse, I think it should be in the context of like uh, rethinking our systems, uh, redesigning product re uh, distribution, and also just changing whole uh, business models. And more importantly, I think we do have to keep in mind just transition when we're developing reuse and refill systems. Yeah, that, that's the tricky part, right? Statistic I read from a report 2019 that PET makes up 24% of plastic demand. And PET is really single-use plastic. That's really all it's used for, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So the beauty of the treaty, and Marion, I think yeah. you can say this better, is theoretically, if there's a signed agreement that filters down for each country to make a national plan, correct? Yeah. So maybe, Marianne, you could talk about that then and how reuse might then filter down onto the government level then. Yeah, um, I think what's great about this treaty is that it sort of uh, sets up this framework that people can, um, or local uh, legislators, national legislators uh, can look at and then create a local laws that will um, be applied and implemented at a community level or a city or national government level. Um, with all of these different kinds of reuse systems, we really need to have harmonized criteria and standards um, for uh, reuse and refill uh, so that they can be implemented. And a lot of challenges that we see um, or that we hear about, for example, in Congress is that um, the industry or big multinationals will say that, oh, that's not possible or we're interested in reuse and refill, but there are no guidelines. Um, with the Plastics Treaty, uh, they can no longer have that excuse because there will be clear provisions and then guidelines or there could be these guidelines uh, if they're included in the treaty. And that's vital that we really uh, push for that uh, so that we can enable alternative uh, systems and models. Um, and I think with, for example, the question about water, um, they love bringing that up. The plastic is supposed to be uh, protect our health and things, but uh, we're seeing different kinds of refill models all over the global south um, that actually address that specific issue. Uh, they have water filtration systems being run by small businesses in local communities, making potable water accessible without having to depend on bottled water. And all it needs is um, better standards and a criteria so that you can scale this or even translate it into guidelines for smaller businesses to get into. I think what a lot of listeners might sometimes don't really realize is you know, in a way, and I hope you don't mind my diverging on this one, you know, the global plastic treaty is coming on the heels of the climate change agreements, right? And so what are the climate change agreements? In, me, in my view, one of the most important things was the ability to measure globally plastic. And then the, the second one is it, it just finally forces down to the country level targets and starts creating accountability at the at the uh, country level alongside the best practices that you're speaking of, Marianne. I wanted to certainly refer to the European Union and Germany and how they're mandating reuse and how it's changing the game there and how you think that might influence the treaty and how it might come out and whether you think it's been a good program, something that Asia would benefit from as well. It would be a great help for if the standards is implemented, so it could make the solution grow even faster because currently, why our startups, not just us, yeah, we have a reuse interest group where it consists of people with the same mission and a lot of us are not going on to other cities. Well, it's the scale is still small, but it's also because of some producers, they actually really want to work with us, like they want to explore the reuse and refill model but in the same time, 
do the regulation kind of not allow us to do so? We don't understand this yet. You know, you, you cannot commercialize this in a great scale yet. So these are the things that I think really crucial for us to really complete because by the end, enabling these solution means that it's accessible for everyone, right? But if it's just pilot, if it's just in certain cities, how this could be a great scale and standard could be a big role in it. Yeah, it's uh, interesting that you mentioned the the Germans' uh, policy around uh, target our targets for reuse and refill. And that's really, really good because it prevents producers from using or shifting to false solutions like equally disposable bio-based plastics or compostables that have no system for um, decomposition. Um, having targets, it's a very clear requirement that drives corporations uh, towards investing in reuse and refill. It, uh, it's very clear and then there's no distractions. Uh, this is what you want from them. And this is what's needed for uh, the plastics treaty as well. Um, because if we just sort of say, well, you have to reduce plastic packaging in general, uh, they might start shifting to what we mentioned earlier about other disposable alternatives, and we don't want that. And can you do me a favor and just take a second to just explain what the rule, the reuse regulations are in Germany, or just outline them as, a, as an example? And because I love that analysis that it would eventually... Hopefully, that kind of a guideline uh, get into national plans of other countries, too. Yeah, so um, one of uh, the provisions in uh, Germany's uh, reuse or packaging law has a 70% refilling target. So it asks producers um, to fulfill that packaging has to be refillable, has certain targets. And then um, it also involves retailers, for example, and uh, other producers to see how um, they can embrace refilling and reuse. Um, there's also certain provisions, for example, where um, retailers and producers can't price um, reusable, uh, reusable packaging or products in reusable packaging or in uh, refilling formats much higher than their um, single-use packaged uh, counterparts. So this sort of allows for fair competition in the market. Um, what tends to happen is more um, sustainable options tend to get priced higher. So the average person or low-income communities don't have access to it or can't afford these uh, alternatives. With better targets and provisions like these that prevent uh, overpricing and then regulate um, rates and uh, prices, uh, you can actually make... Um, reuse and refill more accessible for everybody. Hmm. You're shaking your head, Darina. So do you agree with that now that since you run startups that do refill and reuse, having that support would make a difference? Oh, greatly, because by the end, business really is about also like uh, economic of scale, right? Like why I mentioned why also this uh, standard would greatly help us to scale is that the more locations or yeah the more locations that we have the more products that we have it could really significantly um decrease the cost right because it's um it's 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 economically feasible and that economic of scale feasibility that is what make the price could be much even lower than what it is in the market and that could make the solution you know, more inclusive for everyone. And that's what we're trying to also do, right? Uh, at Alnar, at least uh, what we're trying to do is uh, we're kind of trying to unlock how uh, the price could be lower and uh, for, for, the com for, the, for the customers as well as um, to have this, the system that is engaging for the um, customers to, to, in to be interested. Like we, we now have a cashback reward system and but it is actually uh, like so the, the idea is that with Alner like if you buy the second packaging you get a reduction because you're not actually buying the packaging you're just buying the product right but for us it is already validated that customers love 
the system. But for now, for this scale, for it's just, you know, a greater Jakarta area, which only consists of several cities, operationally, it's still very hard, honestly. So the more locations, the more scale that we could have, it could really enable the system to be economically feasible. So standard would play a big role in enabling the system itself. If any listeners could somehow support you, um, with this effort of reuse refill at the treaty and any any time in between what what would you wish for them to do well um for greenpeace uh what our experience has been is that having people voice out uh their demands um whether that's calling for uh, reduced plastic production or more refill and reuse systems uh, that's really important to try to get uh, policymakers to pay attention and really consider uh, their options. Um, people's voices are powerful, and collectively, I think we can get uh, more of our decision makers uh, to pay attention to what's necessary for the plastic crisis. Um, listeners can uh, support uh, petitions, for example, that call for a strong global plastics treaty, um, we have that for Greenpeace, and I'm sure several other NGOs uh, in different countries are also running very good um, campaigns uh, for strong elements for the Plastics Treaty. Um, they can also engage their lawmakers directly and their national delegates directly, um, sending in um, different position papers from the academe and also from reuse providers and uh, refill establishments. Um, their testimonies and their stories will also help validate how and demonstrate how reuse and refill is already working and it just needs uh, the platform and the system uh, to really scale it. Yeah, exactly. Darina, what do you think? Uh, there's a study from Systemic, I think, in last year that uh, re uh, reuse can contribute to 30% of plastic waste in the ocean by 2040, which maybe it's just a number of 30%, but it would mean greatly. Uh, Marianne already mentioned a lot about greenhouse gases and emission, but we are also, we are not just living on our own, right? Like we are living with other um, like creatures, like animals and other exactly. biodiversity, yeah. right? Like this reduction would also mean a lot for of everything in the world that we are co-living in, right? So also the narration is that we we are trying to make a better living, not just for us humans, but everything in it, because we are also benefiting, right? So I think it's uh, it's already very urgent for us to really listen and do something about it. All right, well, thank you guys very much and our partners Break Free From Plastic uh, for pulling this together. Now, Marianne, Good luck at the treaty meetings and our next episode. Thank you. We will talk about what happened. This podcast series was hosted by me, Marcy Trent Long, and produced by Carol Mang. A big thank you to our guests, Marianne Ledesma, Zero Waste Campaigner with Greenpeace Southeast Asia, a Break Free from Plastic member organization, and Darina Malana of Envio Indonesia. We've partnered with Break Free from Plastic, or BFFP, headquartered in Asia to produce this series. BFFP has numerous resources on their website about the treaty. We've put links on our show notes to many of the papers and blogs on this topic. Jill Baxter is a contributing editor, and Alexander Mobison created the intro-outro music made from repurposed and recovered waste items. Thank you for listening. We'll be dropping an episode next from our friends at the Plastosphere podcast. 
which creates a nice backdrop to other issues that will be on the forefront of discussions at the Paris INC meetings. We'll follow that with an episode with Marianne Ledesma again of Greenpeace Southeast Asia, alongside Christina Dixon of the Environmental Investigation Agency to get post-Paris treaty negotiations and their view on what was accomplished and what lies ahead. So stay tuned. <laughs> 